Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody here this morning, and again, just those of you joining us online, too, good to have you with us. Um, I'm going to open up our service by just reading a scripture from Psalm 103, verses 17 through 22. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Randy? Let's stand together and sing the great hymn. It's number 56 in your songbooks. To God be the glory. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory, great things he had done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life an atonement for sin. And opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon. Sing it out. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Great singing. Now turn to those around you and greet them in the love of the Lord. All right, great fellowship, please be seated. Well, later this morning, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper and taking communion together. And in preparation for that, the choir is going to sing a song from the last Easter cantata, As You Serve, Remember Me. Serve and as you 
Good morning, family. It's good to see you on this beautiful Lord's Day. It's always our joy to be together, and it's a joy to be a family. We do have just a couple of announcements for us this morning. Once again, we uh, ask you to look to the, uh, uh, in front of you to the connection card. We never know when you might uh, have a message for us or a question, or perhaps you're new to us today. We'd love to have uh, the privilege of meeting you and knowing you so we could call you. So if you would kindly take that connection card, if you want to make a connection with us, and just write down what it is, and we'll get back to you this coming week. As we we, uh, said earlier, the ladies are on their way home from retreat. We've been praying for them. We believe they've had a wonderful time. Looking forward to hearing from them, but now we're praying as they have their final meeting, they'll have journey mercies as they come home. So let's remember them today. And then on May the 20th, we have what we call TFB Spring Clean. Uh, It's our privilege to keep this campus looking beautiful, and we have many projects, big and small, and we'd love to have you come and join with us as we want to take care of God's, God's building here. So if you could put that aside, 9 to noon on the 20th of this month, a Saturday, we'd love to have you come and join with us. Pastor Ross, can y'all stand up with us, please? And yes, thank God for this building, um, but his kingdom isn't just this building, right? So, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, let's uh, sing with us as we sing Build Your Kingdom Here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. We pray, unveil why we were made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope by wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come and fade us now. We are your church. We are your church. We need your power.
Oh, here are the claps. <laughs> Church, um, can you guys finish the statement for me, please? Uh, the righteous shall live by. One more time. The righteous shall live by. In the end of Malachi, the Lord is going to be talking about a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. So I wonder, do we have a distinction from the people that we're trying to reach? Maybe not necessarily in the clothes we wear or the hairstyle we rock, but in our heart. Is our heart distinct following the Lord and the Lord alone? So in order to have that distinction, for us to be righteous, we are called to live by faith. So may you sing with us just the prayer that God gave us for us. Give me faith to trust what you say that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside. I give you my life. I need you.
Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, that because of you, God, because of you, we have purpose. Um, and sometimes, God, we can we can easily forget that. God, I pray, Lord, that you may set us apart to be holy the way that you are holy, God, to be perfect where you are perfect, God. But in doing so, you call us to not do it just by works, Lord, but faith. <laughs> because faith without works is dead, God. So may the righteous this morning live by faith. We love you, God, in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. <clears throat> if I look like I'm tired today, uh, the wife is at the retreat. Who am I kidding? My kids are easy. This, they, it's like, I don't even have to work. I just say, hey, guys, get up and get ready, and they get up and get ready. And um, So for all you dads out there, though, who have, like, little kids and have to get them, I'm, 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 I hear you, though. I've been there. Um, you know, uh, just a, a quick word about the, the song we just sang. I was able to go to Biola a few weeks ago to a singspiration. They do it like on Sunday nights and uh, fill the gym up. And uh, they sang that song. And just to hear like all these students just singing the song together, asking God, give us faith. You know, we look around us and we think there's no hope for the next generations, right? I was in a room where I was like the oldest person. And it was full of college kids lifting up their voices and raising their hands and praising God and asking him to give them faith to trust what he says. So is there hope? Yes, friends, there is hope. God is still good. God is still on the throne. He still rules and reigns over us. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again, again, right? Um, now, how many of us like rules, though? Rules are made to be, are they really? Are they really made to be broken? Um, speed suggestions, right? Stop suggestions, or are they speed limits and stop signs, whatever that means, right? There are certain things that we know we should be doing and following in life. There are rules that we should do. Okay, um, you know, God has set up these different spheres in our lives, the sphere of family, the sphere of uh, society or, or government, and the sphere of the church. And there are certain things as we live in this world that we are called to, to do. Um, I coach volleyball um, girls uh, age 13 through 15. It's kind of fun. Um, and so they're kind of learning the rules, right, and trying to figure out, and what are these, the rules of this game that they have to play? Now, if there weren't any rules of the game, what would it be like? like my practices. Just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, it would be absolute chaos, right, if there were nothing. Um, and that same thing is in life, right? God gives us rules to live by, um, and, and we'll see why he does that a little bit today and, and why that's important and then how we ought to respond to that this morning. Now, last week, um, or sorry, the week before last, we were encouraged to remember God's promise, God had been so faithful to us, so good to us, so gracious to us, and therefore our response is to be faithful to him. Um, we, we looked at the example of marriage, right? If you're married, the call is to be faithful to your spouse. Um, we looked at the church, right? If, if we're part of a body of Christ, our call is to be faithful to one another. And of course, we know, be faithful to Christ, now, this week, we're going to pick up the end of Malachi with the encouragement to remember his rule, right? We'll see that it's not a burden to follow the rules because of who the ruler is. So I hope today is an encouragement for us to be reminded of who God is and so that when we follow him and we obey his commands, right, because we show we love him by doing what? Obeying his commands, those aren't burdensome. It's not, it's not a list of to-dos and don'ts and all this kind of stuff and stars that we have to put on our chart, and like a chore chart. It's a, it's a blessing. It's a pleasure. It's, it's a benefit to follow after him. Uh, before we dig into Malachi, though, will you join me in prayer, please? Father, we, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that, that uh, you are the one who gives us faith in the first place, and we respond to that. That, that the righteous will live by faith. So, Lord, give us faith today to trust what you say. 
um, to, to walk these, th this road that you've called us to walk, um, to, to walk in obedience to you, um, to what you desire from us. Lord, we need your help in this. Help us to see your word, to know it, to, to, to just dig it in and to apply it to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are in Malachi chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 6 today. So if you'll join me there, Malachi 3, verse 6, and we'll just read two verses, verse 6 and 7, to begin our time. It says this, For the Lord does, for I the Lord, sorry, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And we'll go ahead and stop there. Um, what do we need to know about this Lord? We're called to remember the Lord. Well, what do we see here? First and foremost, the Lord is the one who does not change. In theological jargon, we call this immutability. The Lord is immutable. In other words, he does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Psalm 102, 25 through 27 says this, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. You see, David knew exactly who the Lord was, the one who does not change. And by saying that he is immutable, what we're saying is that his character is consistent. And his plan is consistent in a world that is anything but consistent. Isn't it nice to know that we have a God who is absolutely and utterly consistent in the way he is, who he is and what he, he does? Amen? Amen. So therefore, then the children of Jacob, i.e. the people of Israel, it says, are not consumed. See, the fact that Israel remains despite all the dumb things that they had done and what the other nations had done to them is a testimony of who this God is. It's proof of the Lord's plan and provision and it's proof of his faithfulness. James Boyce said, God emphasizes his immutability to say that he is unchanging in his faithfulness, which is why the people have not been destroyed for their transgressions, right? God could easily have, have, have you know, pointed that finger and said, zap, you're done. <laughs> but instead, he has not, and he has been faithful to them. And if we look at verse 7, that's exactly what the Lord reminds them of, i.e., they have not been faithful to his rule. They have turned aside and not kept his statutes or his commands. And this is where another aspect of God has to come in, right? We know that he is faithful, but we also know that he is merciful. He is merciful. Psalm 103, 8 and 9 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. Now, isn't that a good promise? Because if he kept his anger forever, how long would he be angry? Yeah, that was low-hanging fruit, right? <laughs> he will be angry forever. I just think about the stuff that I've done in my, you know, moments of idiocy um, to, to, you know, make him frustrated or angry with me. And, and man, boy, he has every right to be angry with me forever. And yet he doesn't. Why? Because he is merciful and he's gracious and he's slow to anger and he bounds in steadfast love. You see, his character and his ultimate plan do not change, but God gives people then the opportunity to act, and if they do so, his actions towards them will change. He's giving them a chance, an opportunity to return, and if they do, it says he will return to them. How do they respond? Well, okay, here we go again. Sadly, we get another one of those road trip questions. Are you guys tired of those road trip questions yet? How long? 
when, why, how many more hours is it going to be on the road? Yesterday, we took a drive out to Palmdale, and you would have thought that we were driving all the way across the country. Um, not because of the kids, but because of me. <laughs> but anyways, um, how? And they, they ask this question, how shall we return? How shall we return? If you think about it, that question, though, implies this. They think they have never left. They, they don't think they need to return. It's not like saying, God, hey, God, we need a Thomas guide. You guys know what that was? We need a GPS because we don't know how to get back home. No, the, the implication is we've never gone anywhere. We're still with you. We're remaining with you. We are doing what you told us to do. So how then shall we return? Baldwin says the call to repent meets no response because there is no awareness of any shortcomings. In a sense, Israel has not looked in the mirror. And how many of us look in the mirror and walk away forgetting what we look like? Isn't that what James says? Those of you who read the word and forget to do what it says are like someone who looks in a mirror and walks away and forgets what he or she looks like. Yikes. Never fear, though, because God will tell them exactly what their shortcomings are and what they need to do to return to him. So let's go ahead and continue. Verse 8 through 12 says this, Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And then God says, In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not open And if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so... How do they return? The first thing that God mentions to them is their unfaithfulness in their giving or their generosity. He asks the question, can a man rob God? Or the question is asked, right? And the answer is yes. And how do you rob God? By not giving him what he deserves. You see, the people had withheld from God. They have not fulfilled uh, what they, they said. In fact, they, they fulfilled the name of their forefather, Jacob. Does anyone know what Jacob means? The deceiver. So they were trying to get away with it. They were trying to deceive God. They tried to rob him, and they asked then another one of those road trip questions. Say it with me. How? <laughs> right? How, are we getting tired of that yet? I, I, I digress. How have they robbed him? In their tithes and their offerings. You see, the system that the Lord set up in the law was to give a tithe or 10%, as the Hebrew word means, to the Lord. Now, at this point, I don't think there's a need to look back at those specific places in the law where it's required, but if you want a bit of light reading, please read Leviticus and you'll see. (laughs) Suffice it to say, this is serious business, no pun intended, for the Lord, and thus the entire nation has been cursed a curse you with a curse, right? Because they robbed God, robbed him of what was rightfully his. And so he tells them to remember to bring the full tithe into the storehouse so there will be food in his house. I love what Eric Ortland says. He says this, human presumption of total ownership in a world in which God owns everything is deeply resistant to real worship and devotion. Ooh, did you catch that? Let me say it one more time. Human presumption, to to presume, for, for humans to presume that we own this world totally, in, in, in which actually the reality is that God owns everything, is resistant to true, real worship and devotion. And then he goes on to say, little wonder. God calls his people to return. See, because they weren't trusting in him. They were not trusting in him, and so they were withholding from him. And he even says, look, you guys, put me to the test. 
put me to the test. Test me to see if I won't do something crazy. Give the tithe and wait and see if you obey this command to tithe, I will bless you abundantly. I will open up the windows of heaven and I will pour down a blessing. Which is basically a reference to rain. <laughs> he will open up those windows of heaven and it will rain on their land. Interestingly, do you know the first time the windows of heaven, quote unquote, were opened? It was back in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. Now that time, why were the windows of heaven opened? Judgment. Judgment upon the world. But this time, if they return to him, the windows of heaven will be opened in blessing. Isn't that what we want? Blessing. And it also says that he will protect them from the devourer, which if you see in some sort of a textual note is probably some sort of a pest that would destroy all their crops, their crops, sorry, and their vines would bear fruit. In short, it says they will be a land of delight, a land flowing with milk and honey, a promised land. This is nothing new, friends. This is nothing new for them. This is simply God reiterating his promise. And yet, one commentator said this, God promises to meet all their needs, but not necessarily all of their greeds. Ooh, I hadn't heard that one before. You heard that one? He promises not to meet all their needs, well, to meet all their needs, but not to meet all of their greeds. And just for kicks, Ortland says, when Israel is asked to give back a fraction of what was never truly theirs, God responds everything that he has, everything that he has. And then we're told finally that the evidence of God's provision would serve as a testimony to the surrounding nations who will then call them blessed, a reminder of that promise given to Abraham in Genesis twenty two eighteen, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now let's stop here for a moment. How does this relate to you and I? Now, we know we live in the new covenant, that, that by his blood, we're going to celebrate that in a little bit. We, we know that we are no longer bound by the law. Um, so how does this relate to us? Is this still binding upon us? Must we bring the full tithe into the storehouse? Will God remove his blessing or not open those windows of heaven if we do not? Now, I don't want to take up too much time with this. In fact, it wasn't too long ago that I actually preached an entire sermon on stewardship and wrote an article for the Proclaimer on that, shameless plug for, for our Proclaimer, our newsletter. Um, so here it is in, in bullet point format. So ready? Here we go. Don't write it down because I'm going really fast. Ready? Here we go. Number one, it takes a lot to run a church. Just look around you. <laughs> Number two, the tithe, 10%, was around actually before the law was given to Moses because, you know, uh, Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, all right? Three, in the law, the tithe was set apart to provide for the Levites who weren't supposed to do any work so that they can serve in the temple. Next one, free will offerings were also encouraged in the Old Testament. Jesus encourages generosity with the promise that if one gives, he will receive in proportion to his or her giving. The tithe, then, is the gateway to giving. The poor woman gave all she had, two little coins, much more than a tithe. That was 100%, y'all. <laughs> you can do the math with me. Paul said that God loves a cheerful giver, and he also encourages people to give decidedly, not reluctantly, not grudgingly, and not fearfully. See, I think one of the reasons that we might struggle with giving is that we have fear that where am I going to get that money to pay those bills? Well, notice what God says to the people through Malachi. He says, put me to the test. You'll see that I will bless you. You'll see that I will bless you. And number one, the number one reason I say this, guys, that we ought to still be a people who give, and again, it's not about a percentage, it's not anything like that, but the reason we give is this, the reason we have anything in the first place is because God is a generous God. 
Amen? Amen. And so we give because he first gave us. Now, in addition to responding to the grace of the Lord with our treasure, there is also our time and our talent. And we are called to remember to serve. Look at the rest of this, Malachi 3, verse 13 through following. It says this, your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And, and now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. And then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. They shall be mine in the day when I make up my treasured possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. And then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Okay? And so the call is to remember to serve. One can sense that God is, once again, getting pretty frustrated with his people Pretty clear at this point. He says, your words have been hard against me. That is God speaking when he says that. You would think by this point, since God proved each time their unfaithfulness to him and his faithfulness to them, that they wouldn't question anymore. But alas, one more road trip question. <sighs> sigh. <laughs> How much have we spoken against you, they say. Oh, before we sigh too much, however, none of us have ever asked, well, what did I do? None of us have ever questioned that. You see, it's not a new question. And in their minds, they feel that the question is actually an honest one. They feel as if they have served faithfully, but yet to no avail, i.e. they've served in vain. They continue to suffer in the land while the arrogant are blessed and the evildoers prosper, almost as if they're laughing at God, right? But of these evildoers, Baldwin said, they put God to the test by seeing how far they could go in evil you see, the problem with their thinking, the problem with the people of Israel and what they're thinking is this. Most of them have actually not been faithful. They think they have been, but they haven't. They've not been following God as they should have. Boyce said the people are blind to the fact that among those who had been challenging God, they themselves were the most guilty. You see, the people are just as bad, if not worse, than the evildoers outside. Keeping his charge, it says, and walking in mourning, those are parallel statements. They point to the ritual elements of the law. The problem is they may have been performing these duties, but they were doing so hypocritically. Yes, that's an eight-syllable word. They were, as one commentator said, meaningless formalities. At the least, it was without joy. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Is there any element of hypocrisy in us when we enter into this building, when we sit in these pews? Is there anything that maybe God is saying, you're not, you're not praising me from your heart. You're just singing words. You're just going through the motions. You're just dealing in rituals and not in faith. All right? Meaningless formalities. But the good news is, friends, that there is hope. There is hope. Look in verse 16. We're told that there are those who legitimately fear the Lord. Note that they don't complain in public. They simply speak amongst themselves, and the Lord sees them. He sees their hearts, and he takes note. And there's even a book of remembrance listing those who were faithful, those who were righteous, those who serve God, those whose names are written in that book. It says, belong to the Lord. They are his treasure, and they are the ones who will have life unlike those who are wicked, those who do not serve God. And guys, he's not talking about pagans here. He's talking about the people of Israel. This is not without precedent in Scripture. Exodus 32, 33, after the incident of the golden calf, the Lord says to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Again, who's he talking about? The people of Israel. 
Okay, I will blot them out. In the familiar passage in Psalm 139, verse 16, it says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. You see, God knows from the very beginning who are his and who are not. In Daniel's apocalyptic vision, in Daniel chapter 12, 1, he says, But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. My friends, the question is, are our names written in this book? And at the judgment before the great white throne, John declares in Revelation 20, verse 12 and following, he says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire, and if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. One simple question, is your name found in that book of life? How does it get there? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt And if not, get ready to burn. Get ready to burn for eternity because God's wrath is real. His judgment is just. (laughs) And he will pour it out upon all those who do not declare faith in the Son of God. How does this relate to you and I? Is this still binding upon you and I, this call to serve God? Galatians 5 13 through 14 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 20, verse 25 through 28 says this, But Jesus called to them, them to him, and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As with giving, we serve because he came to serve us. As we come full circle, at the beginning we were encouraged to remember who is the Lord, the immutable, unchanging God. Who is the Lord, the gracious God who gives his mercy to us And as the Lord through Malachi closes his prophecy, his parting words once again encourage them to remember who is this Lord. Look at chapter 4 with me, please. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all of the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, said the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So at the beginning, we were encouraged to remember that the Lord is unchanging that the Lord is merciful. We have one more aspect now of the Lord which we are called to remember. We are called to remember that he is a just God. 
When the great day of the Lord comes, his judgment will come like fire. This is not the refiner's fire mentioned earlier, but a fire that destroys utterly. All of those arrogant evildoers whom the Israelites thought were blessed and prosperous will not escape. They will be stubble, not the five o'clock shadow on my face. They will be stubble. It's what's left after being set ablaze by the Lord's wrath. But you see, his justice isn't for those who just deserve wrath. It's for those who fear his name. For justice is not just punishment for wrongdoing, but according to good old Webster, it's the assignment of merited rewards. Proverbs 21.15 says, When justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous, but a terror to evildoers. The Lord will act justly towards them. He will cause the sun of righteousness to rise with healing in its wings. As one commentator said, just as the sun drives away the darkness and clouds and bringing light and joy, so the sun of righteousness will appear to dispel the gloom, oppression, and injustice. It says under this new sun, they will burst forth from the gates like calves that have been held still. Like little kids in their classrooms at school, when the school day is over, what do they do? They run out to the playground and play. That's what it's going to be like. They'll burst forth, leaping and dancing, if you will, it says. And they will trample on the ashes of the wicked. Ortland said, God-fearers will be protected from the judgment of Malachi 4.1. And they will enjoy God's blessing like those well-fed, carefree, playful animals of verse 2. And as Malachi comes to a close, there are two final statements made in verses 4 through 6. They are reminders of where we have been on this journey through Malachi. And I want to say this, they're also reminders of where we've been on this journey through all of the minor prophets. We are coming to the end of our time in the minor prophets today, and this is where we have uh, ben, uh, first, they are told to remember the law of Moses, the law that was given at Mount Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai. It forms the background to all of Malachi. It's a simple statement, but one the people would need to hear again and again and again and again, especially as God was about to go on radio silence <laughs> for a few hundred years <laughs> until he would break forth again in a way that we all know. But in the meantime, remember the law of Moses. Would they continue, that's the question, to obey even when unprompted, unprompted by prophets? And just in case they needed more, they're encouraged then by this promise that the Lord would send Elijah, apropos that it would be the reminder to follow the law of Moses and also that he would send Elijah, representatives of the law and the prophets. And weren't those the two Men who appeared at the transfiguration when Jesus was glorified before his disciples? Yes, indeed. This promised messenger of Malachi 3.1 would be a prophet like Elijah. Probably not Elijah himself, although that is a possibility. I taught the kids today, and we were learning about Elijah and how what happened to Elijah? Woo, whirlwind. Up. Okay. No, it didn't. Fire. Um, reminders of this, right? Some crazy stuff. But most say it was John the Baptist, including Jesus, who says this was John the Baptist, Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. Uh, he says that this was John the Baptist who came and preached repentance and the coming of the kingdom, who came at the appointed time to turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord and towards one another, which is what that reference to the reconciliation between fathers and sons symbolizes. And you see, the book then ends on a statement, which might seem very harsh, does it not? Look, what's the last statement? A decree of utter destruction. But we're missing a small word. What is that word? What are we missing there? I'll come, I'll turn the hearts of the father and children, praise God, the hearts of the children of the fathers, lest word lest I come and strike the land. It's a tiny little word, but that word brings hope. 
right? God promises a messenger who will prepare his people so that judgment can be avoided. Isn't that what the minor prophets have been all about anyway? Years later, at his birth, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, would prophesy concerning his son and also the son of God. Luke 1, 76 through 79. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Notice that reference again to the sunrise, to the sun of righteousness, or may we say S-O-N of righteousness. Martin Luther said, under the law there is weakness and condemnation, but under the wings of Christ, under the gospel, there is strength and salvation. He is indeed the sun of righteousness. So friends, as we wrap up Malachi, and really as we wrap up this whole series for the first part of this year on the minor prophets, there's a call. And that call is to remember the Lord, remember his rule by walking in obedience. As the final prophetic book of the Old Testament in, the Lord shows us the simplicity of his requirements as we await the day of his appearing. We keep ourselves ready by walking in obedience. First, remember, who is the Lord? He is unchanging, he is merciful, and he is just. And then, in light of that, walk in obedience by remembering to give and to serve, neither of which is a burden when we consider what the Lord has done for us. At this time, I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready for our time of communion today. And isn't it apropos that why we do this? Why do we do this, friends? We do this in remembrance. Look at them on the screen. I didn't even plan that. Jason, is that you? Good job, buddy. We do this in remembrance. How many times have we been called? Look at all the minor prophets. Remember the Lord. Remember his works. Remember his commands. Remember his promise. Remember his word. Over and over again, this call to remember because how quickly, how prone we are to forget, to leave the God we love. So this call is to remember. And as we have communion together, let us remember who this Lord is. Will you bow with me and pray, please? Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you that you are trustworthy, that you are merciful, that you are you, you never end, you never, you never change, and we can hold on to that. We can hold on to those aspects of your character, of mercy and of justice. And so we then become people who walk in obedience, not because it's a burden, but because it's a joy. It's a joy to be generous because you were so generous to us. It's a joy to serve because you have served. May we be reminded of your ultimate act of generosity and service as you came to become one of us and as you died upon that cross. As we remember your body and your blood, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, will you please come forward? Raj, join me, please. Cheryl's going to lead us in a time to just sit and, and reflect on what we've been learning, to reflect on the true meaning of this act of remembrance, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Take one of the elements as it passes and just hold on to it.
that hill far away stood an old rugged cross, an emblem of suffering and shame. And that emblem of suffering and shame has been turned into an emblem of peace and joy and life because of what Jesus did upon that cross. His body was broken. His body was broken. Why? So that we might be made whole. As we come to this table, we do this in remembrance that act. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again that you did send your son, Jesus, to become one of us. Jesus, you, you were the bread of life. You are the bread of life, and, and, and you is all sustenance. And, and you came and, and you allowed your body to be broken so that we can experience the true peace, the true shalom of the Lord. Thank you for the broken body and this bread, which allows us to remember what you did. We ask that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. He said in that upper room, this is my body. Please take and eat. As I come to the table of the Lord, four powerful words come to my mind. Love, grace, mercy, forgiveness. Everything I do not deserve, but everything he freely gave because of who he is, our Savior, the only one who by shedding his blood could cleanse us of our sins and how thankful I am and how thankful you are for this abundant gracious God who paid the debt we owed but could never pay the blood of Jesus Heavenly Father we thank you for your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is to know him, to be forgiven of him. Thank you now as we partake of this cup, which signifies his blood shed for us. May we take it with great joy and great thanksgiving in his name. Amen. And that night in the upper room, the Lord Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink it in all in remembrance of me. Randy, will you come and lead our closing song? Can we stand together, friends, as we close our time? Number 339, by his grace. By his grace I am redeemed. By his blood I am made clean. And I now can know him face to By his power I have been raised, hidden now in Christ by faith. I will praise the glory of his grace. By your grace I am.
By your power I have been raised, hidden now in you by faith. I will praise the glory of your grace. Remember his word, remember his promise, remember his rule. Let us go forth from this place remembering who God is and what he has called us to do as we live it out in this world that is in desperate need of him. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Have an amazing day. We'll see you soon. Those watching at home, we love you. We hope to see you soon.